Hello and welcome back once again to History for the HSC and another deep dive into the New South Wales Modern History Core Study of Power and Authority in the Modern World. Today, we're going to have a look at cultural expression within the Reich. In doing that, we're going to both discuss what was encouraged along with what was discouraged or outright banned and doing some further discussion of some of the more important personalities involved in cultural expression in the Nazi state. One of these personalities will of course be Albert Speer, who we can see depict, depicted as our title screen. So with that said, let's get a move on. Today's study of cultural expression in Germany is focused on the following syllabus dot point. The impact of the Nazi regime on life in Germany, including cultural expression, religion, workers, youth, women, and minorities, including Jews. Now, as we've done for the previous syllabus outcome, we're going to break this down into smaller subpoints, and today we're just focusing on the first of these, that is cultural expression alone. Now, if we stop for a moment at this point to think about the nature of this outcome, you can see that it's focusing on the impact of the Nazi regime on life in Germany. And this tells us a few things about what sort of things we are interested in knowing and what sort of things we're going to be looking at as we work through a series of deep dives on this particular outcome. Let's take today's topic as an example. We firstly need to know what cultural expression looks like under Weimar, perhaps not in huge detail, but enough to be able to speak of the impact and therefore the change that the Nazis wrought. And secondly, we need to know what cultural expression actually did look like under the Nazis so we can have an endpoint of comparison to that. And to fully understand these concepts, we also need to understand the why and the hows involved. Why did the Nazis create a change in the cultural expression of the German nation? How did their actions go about creating that change? Now, a lot of this how and why we've already covered in some amount of detail already, but it's important to keep in mind as we go through this dot point, how you can link your knowledge here to previous concepts that you've studied. And so these are the questions we're gonna ask in each of these series of deep dives on this syllabus dot point. What did it used to be like? What was it like under the Nazis? How and why did the Nazis change it? So with that, let's start. Let's break this up into different types of cultural expression as a way of coming up with some subtopics. Now, obviously, be aware there's a lot of crossover here, and we're not going to be covering every element of cultural expression, just the four that we feel most encapsulate the impact the Nazis had on life in Germany. Firstly, this will involve a study of the regime's use and abuse of art, thinking about what made good art under the Nazis and why. Secondly, a discussion of music in the Third Reich. What was the Nazis' view of music? Uh, from those pieces they liked and also to those that they despised. Thirdly, literature. What was wrote in Germany that became seen as appropriate and what would face destruction? Before finally, we'll have a look at what Nazi architecture can tell us. And from here, we'll spend some time having a good look at Albert Speer himself. So with that started, with that said, let's get started with a look at art in Nazi Germany. Art during the Weimar period flourished. Firstly, this was part of the ongoing explosion of what's called German Expressionism. And it's important to understand that expressionism went beyond simply the visual arts and it included many other subtopics that we'll discuss today, like architecture. Expressionism focused on themes such as romanticism, fantasy, raw emotion. But as the Republic went on, expressionism as a style began to wane and it was replaced by Dada, which is an art style that rejected logic and focused on irrationality in a, as a sort of protest. And further, the new objectivity movement, which would carry on 
many of these same precious themes of Dada, highlighting also the horror of war, moral decadence, and the rise of Nazism as some of its major themes. And it goes somewhat without saying, really, that these styles of artwork found no favor from the Nazi regime. On the 1st of November, 1933, the Reich Chamber of Fine Arts was created, and it formed one of the seven departments of the Reich Chamber of Culture, which we uh, discussed in an earlier video on propaganda and censorship. You can see that using the link above. Now, as part of this organization, we can already understand that their main goal would be to promote German culture, at least the Nazi approved image of German culture. And membership of this group was essential in order to work in the creative field, to have approval uh, of the pieces and the right to exhibitions that required the support of the regime. And there was naturally a large degree of artistic censorship, both official and artists self-censoring in order to be able to actually work. So what then did the Nazis think was appropriate art? Well, one place we could look to find out is what's called the Goppen, uh, Goppen, Goppen the, the God Gifted List. Sorry, can't pronounce German today. This was a list of artists considered crucial to Nazi culture. Now, a few things to note here. Firstly, by artists, they also include architects, writers, composers, actors, singers, many others. And secondly, the list contains some 1,041 names. So don't make the mistake of thinking that this must mean that that person was named is in some way supportive of Nazi ideology. Some may have been, but some weren't. The list was developed by Goebbels in consultation with Hitler in September 1944, and many of the people named on that list had died long before National Socialism came into existence. The Nazis simply liked what they did. They saw something about it as being quintessentially Germanic. Most of the artists on the list aren't particularly well known today. However, they all developed a quite traditional, romantic, classical, realistic style, which was in clear contrast to what had been popular under Weimar. One piece that picks up on this theme is not actually part of the God Gifted list, but it really picks up on this theme and also highlights the use of art as a means of propaganda is Hermann Otto Hoyer's 1937 piece, In the Beginning Was the Word. In it, Hitler is seen talking to a crowd of Germans. Mid-speech, we see the crowd enraptured with his words. It shows us both the style that the Nazis idealized and promoted their ideological belief in the Fuhrer, the importance of his words. Now, another significant point of discussion is what's called the Degenerate Art Exhibition, which occurred on the 19th, from the 19th of July to the 30th of November, 1937 in Munich. This event was supposed to coincide with the Great German Art Exhibition, which would promote what was seen as appropriately Germanic art. The 650 pieces of art which had been confiscated by the Nazi regime um, all reflected the earlier experimental Dada style of modern art that existed under Weimar. Here, that art was presented without its needed context, erasing its original meaning, and those who visited were instead presented with artworks in a manner which encouraged their derision, their scorn. In the first six weeks, over 1 million people would visit the Degenerate Art Exhibition. They saw works such as Jean Metzinger's 1913 and Cannot in Many of these pieces would then be sold off to the lowest bidder as a means of the party gaining some money from the sale of confiscated goods. And some would never resurface, such as this work here of Metzinger's. Others would then find their way into the collections of leading Nazis and perhaps most famously, Hermann Goering, whose collection of stolen art, much of it from Jewish people, um, was found at the end of the war and captured by allies. It numbered some 1,375 different paintings. Many of them would never be returned to their original owners. And so under the Nazi regime, art in Germany had gone from avant-garde to traditional landscapes and portraits in a classical style, and it focused on themes that supported National Socialism, on the uniqueness of the Volk, 
on the glory of the Führer and of Germany. Music, in much the same way, played an important role in indoctrinating the German people into the spirit of Nazism. It too would come under the umbrella of the control of the Chamber of Culture, specifically the smaller group within that, the Reich Chamber of Music. Now under Weimar, classical music had remained an important style. However, it was increasingly moving towards a more modern variant of it. And beyond that, jazz music had become popular. In fact, many of the modern classical composers had begun to use elements of this jazz style of music in their classical pieces. The final style of music that had become popular under Weimar were cabaret shows, which became a popular pastime among the young and particularly in the larger cities. The nature of music under the Nazis varied from this significantly and was largely due to competing visions of Joseph Goebbels and Alfred Rosenberg. Now Goebbels' role in this is clear. As head of the Ministry for Public Enlightenment and Propaganda, he held sway over all creative expression within the Reich. And in general, he had the most significant role in the development of music in Germany under the Nazis. However, Rosenberg's role in this cannot be ignored. And as we've not really talked about him before, I wanna spend a little bit of time now giving you a brief background on his role. Alfred Rosenberg had joined the Deutsche Arbeitspartei in January 1919, eight months before Hitler did. And in 1923, following the failed Beehor Putsch, Hitler had actually appointed Rosenberg as a leader in his stead. This doesn't appear to be a job that he did very well. There's actually some suggestion that Hitler deliberately chose Rosenberg to act as his leader, knowing that he was weak and lazy, and therefore he wouldn't get ideas above his station and potentially challenge Hitler's return to the leadership when he was released from prison. Regardless of whether that's true or not, Rosenberg was one of, if not the chief Nazi theorist. His work, The Myth of the 20th Century, effectively created the Ladder of Races idea on which the Nazi's social Darwinist ideology would be framed that saw the Aryan race at the top of this ladder and the Jewish Untermensch at the bottom. And up until 1939, at least, Rosenberg battled Goebbels for control of the cultural spheres of Germany. It was a war he'd eventually end up losing, although he did win some battles, forcing Goebbels to back down on various uh, composers and musicians who ended up to be Jewish. Goebbels, in the end, had the trust and respect of Hitler, something Rosenberg lacked. Now, the main aim of music under the Nazis was firstly to exclude any Jewish composers or musicians and to promote works that were seen as German. This meant music, much like art, was treated as a form of propaganda, with music censorship being the norm. Now, perhaps the best known composer that was associated with Nazism is Richard Wagner. Wagner himself died in 1883, some 50 years before the Nazis came to power, but he was quite simply the favorite of Hitler. Hitler, it would seem, saw Wagner's opera, and in particular the Ring Cycle, with its themes of violence, of sacrifice, of Germanic myth, is almost a precursor to Nazism. Now there's an often repeated quote, which is ascribed to Hitler, which says, whoever wants to understand National Socialist Germany must know Wagner. William L. Schreier continues, his towering operas, recalling so vividly the world of German antiquity with its heroic myths, its fighting pagan gods and heroes, its demons and dragons, its blood feuds and primitive tri tribal codes, its sense of destiny, of the splendor of love and life and the nobility of death, which inspired the myths of modern Germany and gave it a Germanic Weltallschung, which Hitler and the Nazis with some justification took over as their own. Shira is arguing that Hitler says to get Nazism, you need to understand Germany, uh, Wagner, that Wagner's work is a precursor. It's part of where the Nazi ideology comes from. Now, where does he get this idea from? Shire himself was a war correspondent in Germany uh, for the US. So he worked for a US newspaper and he wrote reports on the war that was occurring in Europe up until December 1940. Remember, the US were not involved in the war at that point. He gives this account of Hitler's obsession with Wagner as a personal anecdote. This is something he remembers hearing himself. 
And he does actually offer some further evidence of other works that mentioned it. Now uh, you can find it on that page of his uh, book 113 of the Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. Um, it is, however, worth saying at this point that many modern historians dispute this quote as being legitimate. Regardless, the work of Wagner does seem to have played some sort of role in what the Nazis thought it was to be German and this fighting spirit that they wanted to create. Um, and that Wagner's work has been associated with Nazism, rightly or wrongly. It's still often not performed in uh, Israel as a result. Now, just like the degenerate art exhibition, the Nazis would also develop a degenerate music exhibition and was designed in a similar way to show the evil Jewish influences of music that was considered non-German, and in particular jazz and anything obviously written by a Jewish composer. Jazz music, however, did play a role in opposition to the regime through what were known as the swing youth, teenagers whose opposition to Nazism came in the form of listening to music that was banned and picking fights with the Hitler youth. The state-run radio stations, supported by the many people's receivers radios that Goebbels had placed in so many houses, enabled the state to ensure its population heard appropriately Germanic pieces, pieces that supported the party line. And these radio stations actually played a surprisingly different array of varying musical styles. It wasn't just classical, but also what amounted to the pop music of the day. This was not necessarily seen as degenerate, and it would be accepted so long as it promoted the ideals of Nazism. We now come to look at the impact of the Nazi regime on literature within the state. Now under Weimar, literature had expressed probably what you could amount to a largely pessimistic view, reflecting somewhat the realities of the failing political system and the impacts of the Great War on Germany. It had also been incredibly progressive. It included the first openly homosexual stories, for instance. And much like with art and music, it was this progressive nature that the Nazis in particular strove against. As Goebbels put it, any books which acts subversively against our future will be destroyed. The soul of the German people can express itself again. These flames not only illuminate the end of an old era, they also light up a new. And here he is speaking at a, a book burning. And it was these book burnings which became so synonymous with literature in the Third Reich, a symbol both of the rampant censorship that was so common, but also the progress of Gleichschaltung and the coordination of a unified Volksgemeinschaft. At the Orpenplatz or Opera Square book burnings in May 1933, some 40,000 people would gather together, Goebbels spurring them on to say no to decadence and moral corruption. 25,000 so-called un-Germanic books would be would feed the fires that night. That be, the book burnings began there, but would spread throughout the state. Many significant works and authors would be blacklisted. Their works burnt. H.G. E. Wells, the works of communists, works of pacifists, historical works that were seen to undermine the special role of the Aryan race, race. writings of a sexual nature, anything written by a Jewish author. One of the more famous works banned under the regime was Eric Maria Remarque's 1929 classic, All Quiet on the Western Front, a work which had been translated into 22 languages and sold two and a half million copies in its first year and a half in existence. A book which then led into the 1930s film of the same name, a film which went on to win two Oscars for Outstanding Production and Best Director. But the book, and then the film would be targeted by the Nazis for its anti-war themes. When the film opened in Germany, uh, German cinemas in December 1930, before the Nazis are in power, SA members led by Goebbels targeted the premier with stink bombs, yelling out Judenfilm or Jewish film. And by May 1933, with the Nazis in control of the state, it would become one of the first books banned in this new Germany. Remark, 
was now living in Switzerland and later would migrate to the US and he remained away from Germany throughout the period of Nazi rule. Within Germany, he was publicly attacked by the Nazis. Misinformation used to uh, and spread attempting to discredit its service in World War I, suggesting that it was a lie. And whilst he himself was safe and could not be targeted by Nazi repression, his family was. His sister would be beheaded by the regime for undermining morale in 1943. At her trial in the People's Court, she was told, your brother is out of, I'm sorry, is unfortunately beyond our reach. You, however, will not escape us. Under the Nazis, such anti-war themes, such as what's found on All Quiet on the Western Front, could simply not be allowed. In fact, censorship of work was such that only four real topics were deemed appropriate for literature. The first of these were books that promoted a pro-war view and the camaraderie experienced by soldiers on the front line. Hitler had called World War I the happiest time of his life and was essential in order to secure war support in Germany to present the experiences of soldiers at war in a positive manner. It was this in particular that Remarque's work had undermined. Second were works that promoted the Nazi worldview of the various ideologues of the party. These works promoted Nazi ideologies espoused by Hitler and by Rosenberg even. Thirdly, regional novels promoted various regions of Germany focusing on what made that particular region special to the German people, what made the German people special. And finally, books which focused on racial doctrines, the greatness of the Aryan race, the Ubermensch, and particularly in comparison to the Jews and other Untermensch. So what impact did the Nazi regime have on literature? Now, in essence, it was a complete stifling of creativity. Classic pieces such as All Quiet on the Western Front, a book known throughout the world would find no equal in Nazi Germany. Whereas previously the works of German writers had been translated into many languages, scarcely a writer active in the Third Reich achieved a reputation beyond its borders. In an ideologically driven attempt to control cultural expression, the Nazis were ultimately successful at the time in controlling what books the German people could consume. Like everything else um, that came under the control of the Ministry of Propaganda and the Chamber of Culture, literature was effectively controlled through censorship of books so that the, re that the regime wanted censored, so that other works could be acting as propaganda promoting the party ideology. The final aspect of cultural expression relevant to our study here is to look at the nature of architecture in Germany under the Nazi regime. Now, moving back again, the main architectural school of design associated with the Weimar period was what's called the Bauhaus movement, which was developed in 1919. It was an architectural and design movement that originated in Germany itself uh, in the Bauhaus, a, a German art school. Bauhaus was a type of modern design that used simple geometric shapes, squares, flat surfaces, etc., and a simple color palette. It also frequently made use of very simple materials, glass, concrete, seal, as its main and often only construction materials in the whole building. Bauhaus went on to have a major impact on architectural forms throughout the world, but the school itself would be closed by the Nazi regime in 1934, a victim of the same attack on modern cultural expression that we've seen in the other aspects that we've already discussed. The Nazis favored a more traditional design in terms of architecture that they produced. It was neoclassical, taking on elements from Greek and Roman styles, but stripping back much of the ornamentation that we'd associate with Greek and Roman buildings, making them much more simplistic and utilitarian in their nature. And the man most connected to this style of architecture and to Nazi architecture in general is none other than Albert Speer, seen here discussing architectural plans with his Führer. 
Speer had joined the Nazi party on the 1st of March, 1933, sorry, 31. And at this point, he was a struggling architect with no real options open. His first big break following that came with a commission to renovate the Nazi party's Berlin headquarters. It was a commission given to him by Joseph Goebbels himself. And this was the thing that first brought him to the attention of Hitler. Following on from that, he was given the task of overseeing the renovations to the Chancellery at the end of 1933. At this point, he was still working on another architect's design. However, this did give him intimate access to the Führer. Speer quickly became part of Hitler's inner circle with the Führer spending time with him every morning, discussing the ongoing state of the renovations about architecture in general, and dinner with Hitler would follow most nights. By 1934, Hitler had be sorry, Speer had become Hitler's chief architect. Given the chance to undertake major building programs, including a revamped Nuremberg rally ground and a renewed Berlin or Germania. This was an amazing opportunity for Speer, who commented in his own work, for the commission to do a great building, I would have sold my soul like Faust. Now I'd found my Mystifiles. He seemed no less engaging than ghosts. Speer would go on to be made head of armaments for the whole regime as a whole before the war itself would end, eventually end and Speer would be captured and placed on trial at Nuremberg. From here at Nuremberg, the second life of Albert Speer would begin as he successfully managed to perpetuate the myth of the good Nazi showing remorse when it was required and carefully recrafting the truth in his retellings to absolve him of blame. He would be found guilty of war crimes and crimes against humanity for his use of Jewish slave labor during his stint as Minister for Armaments. However, he would escape the death penalty as he was able to claim he did not know of the killings that were happening during the Holocaust. And at the time, the prosecution could not prove he was aware of them. It only came to light in 2007 when a piece of his private correspondence, which had been written in 1967, was finally made public. Speer was well and truly aware of what was happening in the concentration camps. Regardless, he had spent 20 years in prison and following his release went on effectively a publicity campaign, convincing the world that he was innocent, that he should be forgiven. He successfully crafted an image of a man who was really only interested in architecture, who had failed to see the regime for what it really was and was deeply regretful for his role in creating it. And this was the myth that existed throughout his life. He was incredibly successful in creating it. It wouldn't be until 1999, far after his death, that mainstream historians had well and truly debunked this spear myth. It would be some more years after that before public perception of this so-called good Nazi were well and truly erased. Speer's great building of Germania, of Berlin, would never eventuate, existing only in his mind and in Hitler's mind and in the plans and the architectural designs. Indeed, the Nazis, in the end, had relatively little time to engage in architecture. Whilst plans were put in place to build and rebuild once the war was over, this could not be while the war was ongoing. In the end, much of what was built did not last. And with the intentional demolition of Nazi era buildings and structures, such as for example, the Führerbanker, where Hitler would spend his last days, the few that do remain have become sort of tourist destinations, which has sparked a new debate over their value. Where the tourists visiting these are there because they have a historical interest or whether people visiting are in fact part of neo-Nazi groups going on pilgrimages to Nazi sites. And it's an ongoing concern and discussion in Germany and in Austria and parts of the world with Nazi era buildings still there. This has been History for the HSC and our latest deep dive into the power and authority topic. Please remember you can download this end screen using the two links in the description below.
a similar video and the subscribe button should be appearing on the screen round about now, which you can use if you feel like. Feel free to like, leave a comment, subscribe, all of that if you want. Next time, we are going to move on to have a look at the impact of the regime on religion. But until then, keep studying.